So, where do we get this list of charisms? I mentioned earlier there's 20 some, and you will find like the Calvin Gifted program will have a slightly different numbering and maybe break it out a little bit differently. So, you'll have some disagreement on exactly how many charisms there are, usually somewhere in 20 or so. Uh, there's 20 listed here. I just wanted to take a moment and ask you to bring your Bibles. Um, just to note that we're not making this up.
Okay, that can be the way that you, you differentiate between the two. Um, so someone with helps um, may come to someone like me, a youth minister, and say, what can I do to help? What, they, they often use that word, help. I may say to someone else, what can I do for you? If I see someone's overwhelmed. If I see a friend who's overwhelmed, my natural, I want to help a friend. I'll say, well, what can I do for you? But someone with helps very naturally says, how can I help you? What do I have to give that will help you in accomplishing your task? So they may write the name tags for you, or organize the potluck, or organize your bookshelf, whatever it is. Something that helps someone else accomplish their task. Hospitality, to open one, one's heart to welcome and receive others as Jesus. Very often providing food or shelter or some sort of comfort. Um, we're all called to be kind. We're, we're, we're Iowa nice, right? We're Iowa nice. I'm not from here. I'm from the East Coast. I will tell you, you're Iowa nice. It's like nice with icing on top, okay? It's a good thing, but that, that is so part of our culture. Sometimes we mistake that as hospitality. Hospitality. hospitality are those people that when you're in their presence, you feel your most self. You are just utterly comfortable with who you are, with who they are. They make you feel as if Christ himself believes everything about you as they see it. So that, that difference is not kindness, not a nice smile, not kind words, not welcome, it's nice to see you. But when you walk in, there's something like, I just need to stay here. I need to stay here. I need to be here. Because they totally accept you as Jesus would. Mercy. Um, you experience deep empathy and compassion for those who suffer and respond with acts of loving service and assistance. You're able to place yourself um, in someone else's shoes and understand what it's like to be them and try to help them in their situation. All of our acts of mercy. We spent so much time last year being called to be merciful during the year of mercy. Um, these people do it instinct instinctually. Um, pastor shepherding. The special grace to commit oneself to the nurturing, formation, and growth of a group of Christians for an extended period of time. Just think of a shepherd. They want to gather their sheep, and they want to take care of it. And if someone goes away, they're going to go after them. And they're going to keep checking in on, on their little sheep. Okay? They want to get a group together and take care of their spiritual needs, you know, making sure they're, they're good individually as well as a group. Um, many of these we are called to as Christians. These are virtues we're called to as Christians. We're called to serve one another. We're called to support one another to do acts of mercy. So sometimes discerning these, you might think, well, yeah, I, I, should, I should do all these. Well, that's just your life as a Christian. Those who do it instinctually, naturally, with joy, brings themselves joy, that's when you begin to see a gift. So you'll see some of the lists of things that, jobs or, or tasks that you can accomplish um, if you have these gifts. Imagine a greeter or an usher here at St. Joe's with the gift of mercy. They're going to be kind, they're going to say hello, they're going to say welcome, but imagine being greeted with someone with the gift of mercy. What that, how that might literally pull someone into this parish, into the sacrament of the Eucharist. Um, imagine a, a hotel concierge with the gift of hospitality. That's a place you'll spend any amount of money to go back to because you feel like they took care of all of your so it doesn't have to be just in the ministry world, in the, the, the church world, that you use your gifts. You're called to use them at all times, because we are called to be Christian at all times. So when you can expand your, your gifts, your spiritual gifts, out into your secular world, then you're getting somewhere. Then you're taking Christ where he wasn't before. Think about these two in regards to um, different, different roles that maybe you don't think of it naturally when you think of the title and it brings you straight to this job or this vocation. Like I heard when you know, we had people raise their hand who were a uh, pastor shepherd. You were like, ooh, you know, are we supposed to be a priest? Are we supposed to uh, think the wives are probably saying no? <laughs> a small group facilitator. 
as an example. So just because you have the charism of a pastor doesn't mean you need to become a pastor of a parish. There's ways to pastor, there's ways to shepherd, like being a small group facilitator, just shepherding a group of friends and family around you. So just keep that in mind. So the next uh, set is the organizational charisms. These focus on structuring or organization of people and things. So first we have administrative or administration. Who uh, has that in your top five? Okay. There are people that you want to call if you need an Excel spreadsheet done. Yeah. <laughs> um, giving. I don't know how many you have giving. Leadership. And service. Okay. We were very gifted. It's really cool to see. So administration, let's start there. Um, someone who effectively and easily coordinates and organizes a large project or several smaller projects at the same time. People who can really uh, handle a lot of different tasks, a lot of different details, and bring them together in a certain order organization. Use the Excel spreadsheet as an example. Usually, this is a person that likes the type of work of like data entry or likes to maybe come into something and see all the different parts and see how it fits together to fix something that's <coughs> sort of broken. Uh, giving, to give of oneself, one's resources in very generous or sacrificial ways to further the mission of Christ and the church. Again, as you know, Judy said, this, these are things that we're all called to as Christians. So we're all called to be giving. We talk about time, talent, and treasure we can give those three ways of our time, our talent, and our treasure. Um, someone who has the gift of giving is someone who gives without even thinking about it. They give not out of their surplus, but they give sacrificially. They find great joy in giving. Um, it's, it's like, you know, they're giving whether it's money or time or their talents, and uh, they don't even realize it. Again, like Judy said earlier, you might thank them for, oh, thank you for that what, what gift? Thank you for your time. You know, what did I do? They don't even remember it because it just naturally flows and energizes them. Leadership is a special grace to share a vision or ideal with others in such a way that they desire your direction and become motivated to work together to make it happen. If you have the gift of leadership, just look behind you. Are people following? That's a good sign of you know, okay, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm starting this thing, I've got this direction. You know, look behind the people naturally following your lead. Maybe it's in the workplace, maybe it's here at the parish, maybe it's even in your family or in your circle of friends. You're sort of a self-starter who has the vision, who has the ideas, and uh, you're going to bring that vision to others, and people naturally get behind that vision because they see it. You won't necessarily, as someone with the gift of leadership, be the one who executes the vision. Who does it? Maybe that's the administrator. Um, but the leader is the one who casts the vision and gets people to buy into that vision. Service, the ability to see tasks which need to be done to support and accomplish organizational goals and being moved to do them or to offer one's assistance. As Judy said, this, the distinction between service and helps Helps is more oriented towards people. Service is more oriented towards organizations. This is the type of person who, who walks into, say, our parish or any organization and recognizes things that need to get done. And they just do it. Maybe it's here, you know, recognizing something needs to get fixed around the parish, facility issue, and coming to just goes and asks, can I, can I take care of that? And just does it. That's service. They're just going to come into a room and maybe see, oh, the chairs need to be set up. And they don't wait around for someone to tell them what to do. They just start doing it. And that's the gift of uh, service. <clears throat> so a few areas where these gifts might come into play. Um, you know, administration. Maybe um, you know, an office administrator, secretary, manager, um, maybe like a service in the realm of maintenance. 
maybe this would be, I know we you know, have a lot of engineers in our area of Rockville, maybe this is where someone in the engineering field would fall, as far as having some of those gifts of like uh, administration, for example. Maybe someone who's in human resources. Think about at the parish, too. Um, leadership, committee chairpersons. You know, we have lay leadership here of a lot of committees and councils. Maybe someone who's on that committee, but especially the chairperson, it would be important for them to have leadership because they can cast a vision and help people get behind them to execute that vision, to move forward in, in uh, enacting that vision. So that's the organizational charisms. Can you tell more about organizational charisms? Sometimes <laughs> servants want to come in and take care of things so much they don't realize that they're not behind a leader. So that's what I have found. Very often we see people stepping forward. Something needs to be done, I'll do it. But if you don't have that vision, then your job is to wait until someone else is going to take you along. And the leaders very often don't step up because someone else is doing the job. So it was a really good way for me that those two in particular was a very concrete example of when, once you learn your charisms, if you're asked to do something and it's not your charism, perhaps you're stopping someone else from using theirs. So it gave me permission to say no, which was great. It was great. And then, so the things that I did do, I began to find some joy with. So consider that as part of your discernment. Um, are, you, are you putting your gifts in the right areas? Okay, so our healing charisms. Uh, again, two that are very, 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 not me, uh, but fascinating. Healing. Does anyone have the gift of healing? <coughs> wow. How about intercessory prayer? Intercession. Fantastic. Wonderful. Um, I, I find these, um, well, I'll explain first. Healing. To become God's instrument through prayer um, in physical, inner, or relational healing. And then intercession to pray regularly and faithfully for extended periods for the needs of others, knowing from past experiences that prayer can be really peace. Um, I think it's great that the saints that are listed here, the patron saint of doctors, the patron saint of nurses, and um, Raphael the Archangel <coughs> literally means God has healed. God has healed. These people, um, beautiful miracles can happen when their gifts are at work. Um, I have a great story of it, not me being healed, but witnessing a healer. Um, when I was in, I went to high school on the East Coast, and uh, after I had graduated in youth, the youth minister there, Father Vic, invited me to come. He goes, you come and see this woman um, do this presentation. She's a healer. I said, what? She said, He's a, she's a healer. Father. He goes, just come. So we go, we get to this thing. She's in our high school, and you know, high schools have smells. Right? You know, I mean, just the gym hallway smells a certain way, the front office smells a certain way, and that smells. And, um, you know, ours is kind of older, and um, we were in the gym, at, or excuse me, in the auditorium, and she was giving her presentation, and she said, through her prayer, she can know when someone is being healed in her presence. And so she's not physically doing the healing, but she, you know, she could be in an auditorium, and she would go into prayer, and then she would say, God is healing a mental illness over here. God is healing car um, uh, cataracts over here. God is healing um, depression over here. She would just be able to call this out. Well, you're sitting in the room, and you're like, okay, you know, I'm not quite sure. But she really talked a lot about the need for reconciliation, that you have to come with a pure heart to this. And so they had plenty of priests for reconciliation afterwards. So we get in line, we go to reconciliation, because God forbid if I'm supposed to heal, I don't want to not miss the opportunity, you know. But, um, so I'm in line, and I'm standing in line in the front office, again with the smells, and I, there's this overwhelming smell of roses. And that's not the smell of my high school. So I'm looking around like, like there's a bouquet like right by me. And I can't imagine where this is coming from, and Father Vic walks by. And I said, Father, where are those roses? And he said, it's her. <laughs> she emits the smell of roses when, when healing is happening. Wow. 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 So it, it can be, you know, as physically real. Um, lots of times we think it's just healing through a prayer or, you know, it's always God doing the healing. But sometimes we play a role 
in that activity. These two can also be very scary to have. Very scary, because if you, you laid hands on someone and something got cured, imagine. Or if you have a sense that your prayer really played a role in someone's change of life, that's a great responsibility. If you have this gift and it's, it, it is overwhelming to you, this is one where you really want to be seeing spiritual direction. You need a little help and some guidance with it, like how to um, allow this to continue to work through you. Here at St. Joe's, I think um, if, if you are a part of the prayer chain or if you spend time in adoration, um, I know in adoration I love that there's a list there where people come in and people write down um, if they have a special intention that day. I don't know if anyone's ever noticed that. Sometimes they come earlier in the day and there's not much there. When you come later in the day, there's an awful lot there. And being someone who hasn't put something on the list, knowing that maybe I could only stay for 20, 30 minutes this day, you know, thinking about this prayer, but knowing that it's continuing to be lifted up that entire day in front of Christ himself, it's very, very helpful just, to, just offering that prayer. And these is important and hopefully encouraging to know that God works in miraculous ways still today. We read about things like speaking in tongues and miraculous healings and Talk about discernment of spirits, and those seem kind of foreign or odd to us today. But God still is working miracles. And the amazing thing is, He works His miracles through us. So, we have those gifts. We don't need to be afraid of them. We should be maybe cautious and very discerning. But God calls us to use those gifts. Okay, so creative charisms are activity that orders and beautifies. And these would be things like craftsmanship. Who thinks they have craftsmanship? Okay, there's a reason that Lynn is in charge of the quilting ministry. It's craftsmanship. Uh, music. Anyone? Music? Okay. I'm glad you're a cantor here at Sharon. Get to music. How about art? Artists? Good, good. And there's more that would fall under this um, category too, which we'll talk about, like uh, computer use and technology, especially in our modern day, uh, maybe graphic design, and different things that we do on the computer, even with social media. So craftsmanship is physically and artistically creating or designing something, <coughs> often with one's hands, which beautifies God's world or edifies His people. <coughs> All these, just, just think about our rich tradition in the Catholic faith of art, architecture, all the things that we have you know, in beautiful churches around the world. <coughs> and I was thinking about, as you probably heard announced in the bulletin, um, when we were in the Holy Land in January, uh, we, we or probably they purchased for the parish a holy family hand-carved um, statue that's going to go into the church. And we went to this big olive wood shop, and much of it was handmade. And you look at these things and the intricacy of how these Christians in the Holy Land carve these by hand out of olive wood. Like this piece is large, and it's all on one piece of olive wood, it's all hand-carved. And it's just amazing. That's craftsmanship at work. Um, again, those who are doing woodworking, maybe it's sewing, maybe it's quilting, maybe it's being involved with the prayer shawl ministry here, and crocheting and knitting. Those working with your hands sort of opportunities, that would be craftsmanship. Music is to compose, perform, or direct musical arrangements in a way that positively affects and is experienced as a ministry person. Now, you know, you can be naturally talented in music. Um, my family's musical, my mom's a piano teacher. I would not say I have a charism of music. I've always enjoyed music. I've been involved in music for most of my life, but I wouldn't say it's a, it's a charism. Those who have that charism, one, of course, it brings them joy, but you can also sense that ministry. It's not just, so I'm, I'm singing, I have a beautiful voice, or I'm very good at playing this instrument, but using it to worship the Lord. I'm using it to draw other people into worship. 
you've ever, especially at a funeral here, heard uh, Bonnie Blummel sing the Ave Maria, you might sense the charism of music in that, because there's that, just that beautiful sense of God is here and present. Uh, writing, to effectively express oneself in written works which convey human experience, truth, beauty, or instruction that deeply affects the reader. St. Francis de Sales is up here. He's my confirmation saint, so I have an towards St. Francis de Sales. He was a great evangelist, also a great writer. Maybe you read one of his works like The Introduction to the Without Light, is his famous work. Um, so he's the patron saint of writers, and again, there's the charism, but then there might be the skill or the natural talent. Like I would say, in my discernment, um, I likely do not have the charism of writing, even though I find myself doing a good amount of writing, um, like back in school. And you know, I, I did well in school as far as writing papers, got good grades on papers, and writing the worship aid here. Um, so I think. You know, I've developed the skill of writing because I've had a lot of experience, but I don't believe I have charism of writing. So that's something to know. You might be a writer, but does it give you life? Do you enjoy it? Do people respond in a way that is really ministering to them through the, your writing? Okay, so a few examples of ways you can use. Um, you know, maybe it's in drama, in acting. I uh, mentioned woodworking. Again, computer work. We have to remember that, that there's a lot of artistic craftsmanship type work being done, whether it's through graphic design, <coughs> social media, maybe that's something you're drawn to or you might not be drawn to uh, in a different form. If you're gifted in music, of course in the parish, being in the choir, being a cantor, being the pianist for a mass, uh, it, it, it makes all the difference. When our musicians who are leading us in worship have the charism of music, they're not only skilled in singing and playing an instrument, but they really are doing it to offer it as worship to the Lord and lead us in that. Maybe here at the parish, another thing would be like the craftsmanship, for example, the building and grounds committee, where you're fixing things. You're going around and helping fix things in the parish. There's our communications charisms, um, evangelism, prophecy, and teaching. And how many have evangelism? How many prophecy? I'm sorry, could you prophecy again? Okay. And teaching. Okay. Uh, evangelism, to share the good news, one's faith or spiritual experience in a way that draws others closest to Jesus. People just get a sense of God. When you're able to bring them into a sense of God, you're able to share that gospel message without even thinking about it. You know, it's not, here's what I need to teach you today, here's what I need to tell you today. Just your words bring God to others and bring others to God. Prophecy, to envision God's will clear enough to communicate a message, truth or call to God's people of actions needed for today, for change, to now, we're used to hearing about prophets in the Bible, but prophets do exist today. Those people that say those things that, I don't know why I'm supposed to tell you this, but I need to tell you this. And uh, where they offer you an insight or a piece of wisdom that you think, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, that's going to fix everything. That's of God, and they're sharing God's message with you. Teaching, to effectively communicate ideas and information and teach new skills in a way that advances people's growth and understanding of the subject. Um, I know this that gift can be very difficult because how many are how many put your hand up if you have teaching as a gift and then were trained as teachers? Yeah, that gets hard. Okay, because hopefully you are skilled at your craft. You know, at your teaching craft. Um, what I've known, I, I said earlier, I. Uh, trained as an, an elementary special ed teacher. Um, that's my craft, my skill, what I went to college for, um, how I made my living for a while. But I recognize I am not, I am skilled in teaching math or social studies or science. I feel it's different when I'm sharing 
the message of God. It's, it's a totally different experience. I experience no joy when I'm teaching a math lesson. I am accomplishing things, and check, it's done. The kids hear it, they receive the information, they learn. That's part of my job. I can go into a group of high schoolers, or any group of kids, you know, they, they said, nobody showed up for children's liturgy of the word. I could go in and do it. No problem. I trust, number one, that God's going to send me the message. You know, it's, it's going to be there. I'm familiar with the information, luckily, due to my job. But I know that when I'm sharing God's word, I'm going to be able to teach what he needs that somebody in that room to hear. So it's different than just having that skill. And you have to kind of pull that out. Um, how many of you have ever listened to Bishop, now Bishop Sheen, uh, excuse me, Bishop Barron? If you don't, do it. Do it. I highly recommend. And then I've not ever heard um, Fulton Sheen um, on his videos or anything, but I've read a couple of things by him. And it's one of those, like, oh, when you read it, you just go, oh, that's what that means. You know, now I get it. The light bulb goes on. Um, you can see how if you're a teacher, a coach, a catechist, um, in the profession of uh, public relations, Sometimes people in that profession get a, a reputation for being very cunning and just trying to always sell or, you know, but somebody with the gift of evangelism or prophecy or teaching in those roles could really bring about, you know, to the secular world, God's message as well. Okay, so with lifestyle charisms, we have two in particular. Faith. Who has the gift of faith in the top five? Okay. The rest of you don't have any faith, right? <laughs> okay. This is important to distinguish because we're, we're tempted to say, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to, why don't I have faith? Why didn't that show up? Why wasn't I strong in that area? Is there something wrong with me? I'm not a very good Christian because I didn't score high on faith. No, again, it's one of those things that we're all called as Christians to have. In fact, we're given the gift of faith at baptism, but there's a distinction between that gift of faith that all Christians at the baptism receive and the charism of faith. These are the types of people with faith that um, it's easy for them to make what we call a leap of faith and just go out without really knowing what's going to come as a result. The type of person who um, you know just says, God will provide, I trust, God will provide. Think of uh, Mother Angelica, EWTN. There's a story that when they were getting started, she had to, they needed this big, very expensive um, satellite dish in order to you know, broadcast EWTN. She just had the sense of God will provide, so much so that she basically you know, signed up to spend, I think it was, I don't know, 60000 or maybe 600000 dollars You know, and, and she said, God will provide. You know, we need this for the ministry. It's called this ministry. We need it. Lo and behold, the day that you know it's going to show up, and the bill's going to be due. She gets a phone call from a guy, you know, a wealthy person who's down on his yacht, and just said, I, "I felt like God was calling me to give you a call, and I want to give you whatever the exact amount, like six hundred thousand dollars. I want to give you sixty thousand dollars. Forget the exact amount. That's faith. That's radical." Gift of faith. You just step out and trust God to provide. You know, think of Abraham. God called him to leave his homeland and go, not knowing where he was going to go. And he went. That's the type of that radical gift, that charism of faith, where you just step out and go and trust God. Okay, so faith is to have such great trust in God and belief in his will in a given situation that one acts in faith and obedience without concern of the outcome. So, of course, we're all called to have faith, but sort of that radical form of faith that is uh, exemplified here with the charism. Missionary, who is that in the top five? Missionary. Okay, so later today we're going to ship you off to another country. <laughs> the gospel, right? Okay, not exactly. Missionaries to experience global concerns with a great zeal to live one's mission and further the salvation of all peoples, 
worldwide. So there is that global perspective, that sense of reaching the nations, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go to another country <coughs> and become a full-time vocational missionary. You can do missionaries' work, you can live out that charism of missionary here locally. Maybe it's through supporting international missions work. Maybe it's through doing missions work right here in our metro area of Cedar Rapids. But you have that zeal, you have that passion for reaching people, especially on a global level. Again, you might never leave Cedar Rapids if you have that gift of missionary, but you can still exercise it right here in every town. So think of St. Teresa of Calcutta, uh, definitely that radical faith, just trusting God and going out and starting this religious order, but also the missionary spirit of you know, reaching out to people that she didn't know well, she wasn't necessarily comfortable with, but she went out anyways. And of course, St. Francis Xavier, the great missionary to the East, uh, who's the patron saint of missionaries. So this is the uh, mission workers, of course, the religious life, maybe, um, faith and missionary, could be both charisms that would correspond with all to the religious life of the priesthood, maybe involved in the social justice ministries here at the parish, um, intercultural ministries, things like that. Maybe you're helping out with refugees locally. There's lots of opportunities to help out with refugees. And so maybe that's an opportunity to exercise that missionary charism. So understanding charisms comprehends the ways of God and humanity. So we have discernment. Who's got discernment? Um, how about knowledge? Okay, and wisdom. Okay. Um, discernment, to intuitively sense or recognize what is of God, or human origin, or not of God, which turns out to be accurate. When you just get a sense of, sometimes evil, but hopefully more often you're sensing, that's just it's God at work right there, and God is here, God is with us. Um, I was sharing earlier with Sharon that um, I did this retreat with the young people, the high schoolers, we were on retreat early February, and a number of them had discernment as a, a gift that they're exploring. And I, and I was like, I got to look into this, you know, I and mean, what, what is going on here? That is it just that they're excited because they've had experiences? These are kids that come often and they, they go to activities. Um, or are they really, through their actions, getting a sense of God? It's going to be interesting to see how that discernment, like, you know, discernment in the big. Big, uh, little D comes out with the discernment and the big D of this gift. Um, knowledge. To seek, collect, and organize or analyze information and data effectively, advance the good and growth of God's people and the mission of Christ. These people need another gift to share their information. So not, most likely when you have knowledge, it's connected with something else because you can't just have the knowledge. It's got to get out there somehow. So maybe teaching, maybe helps, maybe writing, maybe, you know, Lord knows what he's combined it with for you. But most likely you'll find that gift very closely united with another gift. Um, and then wisdom, to understand and apply knowledge and truth with deep insight into the most effective course of action to take and accomplish the goal. Um, I love that they have, I call them the Holy Trinity of Popes. Um, right up here. Our last three popes. I think it becomes very, very clear when you look at the work that they have done, the difference between discernment, knowledge, and wisdom. Um, pope, saint. It's going to take me a while to get used to that. Saint John Paul II. Um, he gave us an understanding. He was able to say, take scripture and church tradition and call us to a new level. A new, this is what we are, who we need to be as church now. This is what God intends for us. And then Pope Benedict came along, and I must say, I didn't have a true appreciation for him when he was in his reign. Um, I have a deeper appreciation for him now. Because he had so much knowledge, I, I kind of felt a little disconnected. But once you get into his writing, that's where his gift came out. You know, when I would hear his homilies and different, just... This is the information, it didn't connect with me, but when you really get into his writing, you begin to see how that makes sense. 
Um, and then now we have Pope Francis, who is sharing his wisdom of how to put what he told us we needed to do, and he explained to us what we needed to do, how to put it into to work right now. So kind of pulling all those three together, you can really see how those gifts work together. Some uh, ways that you could live this out in your life would be uh, counselors, consultants, ministry, lawyers, and judges. Wouldn't it be lovely if our judges had discernment and knowledge, you know, and, and wisdom? Um, I'll put political leaders up there as well, because that would be lovely for that to happen. Um, outreach ministry, um, his, a parish historian. How great would someone with a knowledge and understanding of our parish writing our parish story? And then it's not just this many members do this many things and cover this much area. It would be about the work of the church. I experienced, um, a friend of mine went to a, a church, she's Lutheran, um, and her dad's Catholic. And so whenever she goes to church with her dad, she always brings me the worship aid and the bulletin. Just because, here, this is your world. You know, I thought you'd like to see that. And um, she brought me a, um, a pamphlet from uh, a church in Minnesota that obviously was written by someone with an understanding of the parish. Because it was their financial statement, and there was like one block at the bottom that had numbers. All the rest is about the work, and the activity, and the stewardship of the parish. And then very down at the bottom, I have it in my backpack, I'll pull it out of lunch and show you. The way they phrased, even it wasn't even financial contributions, it was just phrased in such a lovely way. Obviously the person that wrote that had a true sense of that parish and the mission of that parish. Okay, so I think we've covered everything. Did we miss one? Somebody have a gift? And I think Matt and I touched on this. Um, these are the lists we have in today. We wouldn't dare to make up. So if you find there's something that you wouldn't say, well, it's not really on this list, but you know, this is what's happening in my life, that doesn't mean it's not a care. Okay? We, we just have to find some way to categorize it. So us as humans, we have a way to have conversations.